And this is the radio guy, Dr. Mike Prince. As you may have heard by now, a legend has come towards an end, at least on the surface. But if you know and understand this man like we do and have grown to know and love and respect what he's done and how he's done, and, of course, I'm talking and speaking of no other than Coach Roger Kador. Coach, thank you and welcome again to the Open Mic Broadcast Network. Well, it's a pleasure to be here one more time. It's a pleasure to be here one more time. And um, I know there's been a lot of fuss and hoopla about going on about the uh, the retirement phase two, if you will, because you officially had retired in 2013. Then you were asked to kind of hang along and get some things back lined up. How has all this been for you since it's now officially out the bag? Well, for me, it's pretty good. It's been a lot more. But for me, it's been pretty good. I knew that this day was coming. So it's a lot easier for me looking forward and uh, uh, making this happen. I'm good with it. I'm in a really good place. You're in a really good place. And I heard you saying that, and, and and let's go back just for a minute, Coach, because we're going to talk, as long as you can, we're going to talk about this. How difficult was it for you to come to this particular stage of your career? Well, not at all. Uh, I'm a realist. Uh, you know, I was able to walk away from pro ball, and it was not a big issue for me. It was, this has been easier for me than most people would think because, you know, I knew this day was coming, and uh, I was preparing for it, you know what I'm saying? I didn't want to be like Wayne Graham, the coach at the Rice, who could barely walk in. And, you know, literally, I have other things in my life that's more important that I want to do. And I think that's what made me. Now, now you, you say every man eventually has to come to the realization, or I should say every person, that what was was is not always what it's been, and sooner or later you got to fade into the sunset. When did this really start focusing in your mindset? When did you really know, Coach, that it was time for you to start uh, preparing to exit? Well, around 2011 and 12, I was preparing to uh, You know, and like I said, I did it in 13, and uh, they asked me to stay on and, and, and do it. So it's been a, a, a work in progress. And like I said, it's been something that I'm, I'm ready for. Let's, let's put it that way. I'm ready for it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're talking with the legendary Coach Roger Kador. And, and one thing I was thinking, Coach, and one for, to become a legend, he's not trying to be a legend. He's just simply doing the best he has or doing the best he can with what he has. How is it that you relay the message to, to younger coaches who are trying to be, for lack of a better term, bigger than the game? Well, I've you know you for trouble if you're trying to be bigger than the game. You know, uh-huh. my thing is what I did is every day work hard, go out and do the very best that I could. And then the other things will take care of itself. Once you start trying to write the script at the end of the, the journey, before you get to the end of the journey, you're going to have problems because you're going to have ups and downs, failures. I mean, there are things that are going to happen. In my case, I just went out every day to try to do the best job I could. And when events came up, I made sure I tried to adjust them. So that's my MO. I just tried to do a good job every day. Never was thinking about myself, but always thinking about the young people that I was working with. Yes, sir. Now, Coach, I was uh, fortunate enough to hear your press conference on uh, last week when you when you spoke and you said the game has changed. And um, from me, and, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, uh, but I'm, I was guilty of saying this, and I'm mad enough to back up what I said and thought. I heard, I heard that the game was not – fun anymore or not becoming fun anymore for it became more of a of a uh, task than just to go out there to the ballpark every day the smell of the atmosphere just the camaraderie of everything am i reading too far in between the lines to hear that it was becoming more of a task than a love well yeah because uh what has happened is travel ball uh millennium parents and kids and it's just 
tough to, to, to wrap everything up because they don't want the traditional things. They want things to be easy for little John. It's all about my little John and make sure that things are right for little John to enjoy the step or to play whether he earns it or not. Because that's what happened in travel ball. They paid us an enormous amount of money, and the people trick the parents, and the kids play, and they said to them, oh, little Johnny is a really good player. He can go. They're doing all of that to keep feeding that, that, that money into that situation. And kids are not what they really are based upon what that travel coach tells them or that, uh, that hitting instructor or pitching instructor. They go to all kinds of stuff and spend money, and those people are not being honest with them. So when they come to college where none of this thing matters, it's about hard work and your production, they can't accept it if a coach doesn't play that kid. And we're at a profession where you have to win, not play kids because they pay money to come to, uh, to any university. So, yeah, it's changed tremendously, and nobody want to be chastised anymore. Well, people being able to ride people and make demands on them is good for mankind or lady kind because you get better when people make demands on you. Absolutely. I, I, you, don't hear, you don't hear a complaint from me. I'm considered from the old school cloth, and uh, the, scripture, the scripture even says that God chastens those that he loves. And so right. when we when we understand that it's not about making or picking on you, it's to make you better. Number one, if I didn't think you had the talent, you wouldn't be on my squad. <laughs> so number two, I need to be able to maximize every ounce I can out of you because my livelihood is at stake right here. You could come in here not feeling good, not feeling part of it, and you can sit down, and now the way it has become if you sneeze too hard and don't say excuse me or you don't bless a kid because they sneeze, they're subject to turn you in and say that you were mishandling them. And that's, right. I, that's yeah. exactly what it's turned into. And what is happening, more and more administrators are weak, and they accept these calls and all of this kind of stuff. Well, you know, that's the thing that I've seen, and I want to let you know that's one of the reasons I'm happy to be leaving because – you know, I, I don't see where me giving in to, to that demand is going to make society better. I don't see that. I think you have to have a leader. You've got to make demands, and things will work quite well if you follow those things. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, with, with all that being said, Coach, is it is it me or I, I was reading on a, a social thread the other day where people were complaining that HBCU – programs, in particular baseball, are not featuring a lot of African-American ball players, And they want to say it's a hidden racism. And, and let me first clear the air. I'm not one of those that want to throw race up because of I'm having a hard way or a challenge moment. What I love about baseball in particular, if you can play, it's going to show up whether you're black, white, or polka dot. And that my my theory is I don't care if the kid is black, white, Asian, Hispanic. I need to win because that's how my job is going to be determined on how long I stay at one place or the other. And I don't just pick a kid because he's African-American. I'm at an HBCU school, and because I want to put black kids in, in uniforms, I want to put the best kid that's going to represent my team and is going to help me continue to feed my family. What's your take on that, Coach? That your take is correct. Let's face it: the African American kids who are good ain't coming to the black schools anymore. They're not coming if they're really good, and other people really want them. Let's make sure we understand that. It's getting like football and basketball. They just ain't going to lane. The me getting a Ricky Weeks and them kind of kids. What I did in the early two thousand, it's not probably going to happen again. I mean, they're not going to come. So we need to do that. So. What coaches are forced with is then they have to go to the Hispanic kid or they have to go get a white kid or some other kind of kid. I mean, that's really what has happened. So unless we want to still live under the rock or that stone, the best black kid is not coming 
to the HBCUs to play baseball anymore. You might get one here and one there that developed that got that they miss, and you know that can happen. But you're not gonna get the ready-made kid. They're not coming. Let me ask this question. Can I ask you this question? Why not? Why not? Because they, the same thing happened in football and basketball. They just don't want to go there. They don't think the HBCU is going to provide the necessities that they need. And they got it all wrong because the HBCUs can provide the same necessities because baseball is different than football and basketball. Baseball, it doesn't matter where you play, they'll find you. Well, football, basketball is a little different. I mean, you know, uh, but baseball, I mean, they came and found Jose De Leon. They came and found Fred Lewis and Ricky Weeks and Michael Woods and Trinidad Hubbard, and it's on and on. They found them at my place. You know, they found guys who were drafted in the first round and second round. So, but, you know, uh, it's getting a little tougher now and nowadays. Uh, for us to attract uh, those kind of kids because uh, facilities at white schools uh, are better and kids want better facilities. And there's a stigma that exists with historical black schools that the now generation or millennium kids hear about. There's a stigma that exists. And the stigma is hard to overcome. Yes, sir. Indeed it is. Now, Coach, I've been talking to a lot of uh, younger ball players, and you just hit on something where they talk about facilities, facilities, facilities. And I've, I've come up with a, with a uh, semi-theory. And once again, I'm from old school way of thinking and trained. Uh, facilities play a part, but it's not the part. I believe you've got to have a system and you got to have a baseball philosophy philosophy that you could sell not only to your ball players but to your coaching staff on let's work this philosophy let's build this system and we can win some ball games you've proven that and and for the most part um, um, the HBCU schools would never have the facilities that the counterparts would have, let's just uh, be honest, because of the money ball situation, the money factor. And it's it's kind of by design, which is almost going to lead me to my next question, but we'll let you answer this one right now. Well, yeah, let's face it. Uh, I was at the state capitol yesterday, and they were it was Southern University Day, so they asked me to come in. They gave me a couple of awards. And back in 1984, when Southern was uh, started, they gave Southern $10,000 uh, to operate. Now, maybe in, in 1884, $10,000 was a lot of money. But it doesn't sound like it was a lot of money. And that's what has happened. What is a, it's a, it's a calculated guess that gives just enough money to fail. I mean, that's really what has happened. I mean, over the years, that's really, you just get enough money to fail. And if you don't make do with that and then be creative, sort of like your grandmother had to make that food really good and she got created in the kitchen, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, yeah, really, sir. that's what we had to do. And, uh, you know, so uh, I look at schools like Prairie View, who is in a great system, the Texas A&M system, and they are thriving right now. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And Texas A&M have taken pride in it. They have a valuable asset in Prairie View. That campus is very – it's a military school by the base. They have architect, architecture, engineering. That base is good there for academics. And it's right outside of Houston, and it's between – uh, Texas A&M in Houston, so it's got some value, and they're producing very well, and I'm so proud of that. You see what I'm saying? Yes, sir. But yes, we sir. don't have a lot of historical black schools that are doing it. Where this school is thriving, going up, the other ones are dwindling down like Southern. We're down to 4,000 some students. That's almost unheard of. That's unheard of. What yes. is going on? We've got a beautiful campus. We sit on the bank of the Mississippi River. Great tradition. Why are black kids coming? Something is going on. 
Wow. And, you know, there's a lot of things going on, and it's hurting a lot. Uh, so, um, you know, my job now is to try and find out if we can get more kids to come to that beautiful campus and experience the wonderful thing that Southern has to offer. We're speaking with legendary baseball coach Roger Kador, who served as the head baseball coach for the Southern Jaguars from 1987 to 2017. He has hung up the cleats. He has put the old ball cap and uniform on the shelf right now. And, Coach, I, I have uh, this question that, that has been burning uh, inside of me for quite some time, and it appears that people don't want to answer it on the record. And, and I know that you've always been a man that said what he meant and meant what he said. And I'm going to ask you this question. And you don't have to answer it if you don't feel like you have to. Ahead, I'm I'm ask. Uh, my, my question is, is APR good for HBCUs? Well, it's good for everybody else. It has to be good for us. See, we can't live by double standards in this country anymore. In the beginning, when we had open admissions and black schools were created, because black people weren't educated and didn't have the opportunity, you had to make a different system. You understand? Mm -hmm. Give people a chance. But I think in 2017, we have to live by the same standards. They're going to go out for the same jobs. The same, the, the, they're not going to have two different jobs for the color of your skin. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, so sir. if APR is out there, parents, we got to prepare our kids to be able to meet the APR. You got me? Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. got to have your kids prepared to meet all of the challenges out there to get the very best job and to be in the very best position. So, yes, APR is good because you, it's out there and you have to meet it. The next question, is APR fair? Well, it's probably not fair, but you're going to have to. It's the, just because it exists, you got to meet it. It's just like the standardized tests, uh, uh, this, uh, the ACT and, and that other test, uh, SAT. I mean, they are there. When people say we've got to prepare our kids to be able to pass them, that's what's out there. You see, I'm, in the, I'm of the mindset that you, there are going to be some things out there that you have to be able to meet if you're going to be able to put yourself in a position for the best opportunity for the long run. That's my take on it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because we, we hear the latest report that come out, you have 14 uh, HBCU schools that were um, uh, held back or restricted, if you will, by the APR and uh, a lot of people on one side, they cry foul, unfair, not right, injustice, it's a racist system, but yet we... But you want to be a part of the NCAA, that's the thing you got to meet. You can be a part of that organization. Listen, we just went through this thing in baseball, so I know it's very difficult, okay? And it kept us from winning. But that's it. That, if you want to be a part of that club, you gotta, you gotta raise it. You gotta come, uh, step it up. You got me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that's why I'm asking we this want, question. We want that money that they give us. The NCA gives a lot of money. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. So yes. why won't you? They put stuff out there that you have to me. Why? Well, I mean, no, I don't agree with all of that stuff. Yes, sir. Well, I, our I, kids will do whatever we ask them to do. And so you set the standard, they got to come up and meet the standard. Old That's saying, right. poop or get off the pot. You can't, you no. just can't. <laughs> I wouldn't say like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, good, good, good way. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking with Roger Gator, a baseball legend, not only in just uh, uh, HBCU basketball or SWAT, but baseball as a whole. Uh, Coach, you have been able – to knock down barriers, uh, change mindsets, uh, become the ambassador, if you will, of baseball. And it hadn't always been easy. People see the exterior, Kador, but not knowing what you had to internalize throughout your course on your journey. If you could, without getting too detailed and too personal, share a story that no one would really know if they if you didn't they didn't hear it come out of your mouth yourself 
that you had to endure on your journey? Well, it's ironic. Uh, I'm going to tell you, uh, uh, my sons were in the car with me, and the oldest one said, well, I don't know, you know, how were you able to do it in the 30 years and all what you did with what you didn't have to do it? And I said, let me just say something. What you, what I did didn't start in 1984. It didn't start then. It said it started when I was born because the DNA, my DNA was different. My DNA made me different in my family. I was born with a DNA, and I was a chosen person for this journey. I was the person chosen because I was never going to quit no matter what. And that's what I am. When I wasn't uh, growing up, when I wasn't very well educated because I grew up the son of a sharecropper and didn't get to go to school and couldn't read and write very well, I didn't find fault because I was chosen for this mission. And I got through high school where they socially promoted me. Then I went to college and wasn't prepared. I didn't cry and give up. I met someone who was brilliant, and they helped me by tutoring me. And by the time I graduated, I was on the honor roll. I didn't cry and find fault. But I was the one chosen through my DNA when I was born to be that person, to do what I did. And I'm not through doing it because... The journey has just begun. So that's what I want people to know, that I was a chosen person with my DNA at the day the day I was born to do what I've done because I didn't complain and find fault. When I was ill-prepared, I found a way to make it happen. I changed a lot of minds, not just black minds, but white minds. I changed a lot of minds. That's what makes a person rise above their peers. It's not that you're trying to do it. You have, you are having to do it. You had to survive. And, I had and, to survive. And, yes, sir. And by building that internal fortitude, the next mission or adversity that comes your way, you just shrug your shoulders and say, okay, well, I've been dealing with this practically all my life. Let's move on and let's get to the next journey. Uh, mm -hmm. it, Coach, it has been um, a joy watching your storied uh, career. 931 wins, 14 SWAC championships, uh, three regional uh, wins. In fact, the first HBCU to break that barrier and to, to get that win over Southern Mississippi, if I'm not mistaken. Under uh, Cal State Fullerton. Cal State Fullerton, forgive me. And, 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 you, and you had to deal with it under – some some adverse conditions, adverse facilities, but you always found a way to make it work. And and that's what's so appreciative about you, and that's what's going to be uh, missed about your leadership, not only at Southern University, but you have been on the record for grabbing in the next new coach in, in, in the conference, outside the conference, and sharing what you're willing to share with them. Now that you're on the outside looking in, there will never be another Roger Cator. We all understand that. We've accepted that. But of the, the, the camaraderie that you leave behind, and let's just limit it to the Southwestern Athletic Conference of the current coaches that you have amongst us right now, who do you see being that next go-to guy as far as rallying the coaches together and being somewhat of a mentor? Well, I don't want to get into that because I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I was so different, and people are not the same now because, you know, it's about making money. You know, I mean, that's – I really didn't even think about that. You know, it just happened. But I, I listen to people now, and they want to make money, you know, and that's really big, and they're not going to stay like I did. So I don't know who it is. That agenda is a lot different than mine, and that's okay. I was just – I came through at a different time, and I had a different mindset. All right. Uh, Coach Roger Cador of the uh, Southern University Jaguars, um, some people like to try to give you your roses after you've uh, departed from this side of glory and, and gone back. Uh, I want to, to, to first tell you thank you from a ball player's perspective. Thank you from a broadcaster's perspective. Thank you from 
a show host perspective, and just thank you from a baseball fan's perspective of what you've done and how you've done it and the manner in which you've gotten it done. As we get ready to, as we get ready to, 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 to wrap this up, what would be your parting thoughts and comments to those that are listening? Well, just to make sure that every day you try to do your very best, and you have to love people. Make sure you love people. And always, if you have something of value, share it with others. The Bible says it, and that's what I try to do. When you have something of value, share it with others. Don't try to hide it and create it or share it with others. That's my final thoughts. All right, Coach Roger Kador is fading to the sunset, but not for long. You don't think he's going to sit in the rocking chair and deteriorate. He's got a lot on the table. He is moving, going to be speaking in China and got all other sorts of adventures as the ambassador will continue on. Coach, we want to thank you so much for being a part of us here at the Open Mic Broadcast Network. We look forward to many more of these conversations, if you would ever so be so kind to allow us to do that. And to those that were listening, thank you all so much. This is the doctor, Mike Prince, the radio guy. Until the next time, you be blessed, and we'll see you on the other side.